to be in this stuff ready and, and just to worship with our band and uh, our guys here that put so much time and effort into everything that they do. A couple of announcements. I did speak with uh, one of our elders yesterday, I spoke with Don Ritchie. Um, Don has assured me that he is going to be talking to the elders this week and we're going to be getting a plan set in place to get back to uh, our regular worship of, of meeting in the building. I'm not sure how soon that will be or when it will be, but uh, there is uh, there will be plans in the work for that. So be patient with your elders. They're going to be working hard at getting that taken care of. So uh, continue to keep our uh, first responders in your prayers. Continue to keep our government officials in your prayers as they make all these decisions. There's a lot of confusion going on when things can open when they can't. But uh, just be patient and... Uh, Everything will work out great. We know that uh, God is going to turn uh, the beauty from ashes. We know that uh, he's promised us that. So nothing else for our announcements. Let's go ahead and pray this morning and let our worship team take over here. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come into your house. The opportunity we have to worship you, to sing songs of praise to you, to commune with you, Lord God, to hear another portion of your word. Father, would you please speak through me in spite of my flaws, in spite of my failures. Father, keep a hedge of protection around this congregation as we continue to bring your church to the center of the community. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
hand, dropped the apple for you in a sack, and said, Neither have you tasted my Jesus. The audience of over a thousand people erupted into applause and cheers, to which Dr. Tillich, Tillich left the platform. It appeared that Dr. Tillich had got himself into a little trouble. Now, we can keep ourselves out of a lot of trouble if we were to know Jesus Christ more and spent more time seeing what he wants for our lives by studying his book on a daily basis. Trouble teaches you to praise God because he delivers you from trouble. Fear God because he provides for you in trouble. And cry out to God because he responds to you in trouble. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. Father, we thank you for this time of worship. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to hear another course in your word. Father, I pray the words today that I preach would fall upon fertile hearts, Lord God. Father, that they would take these words that I preach, that you inspire me, that you give me, take them to someone that doesn't know you. Let them see your love through them. Let them introduce someone to Jesus. Father, I know that you desire for no one to spend eternity without you. Father, help us with our goals here, with placing you first in our lives and our hearts and everything that we do. May we bring glory and honor to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Late in the summer of 2004, Bonnie, Charlie, Ivan, and Jeannie each decided to enjoy a brief vacation in Florida. Now, Florida welcomes a lot of vacationers in their state every year, but these turned out to be the most unwelcome guests in many years. They caused millions of dollars in damage, and when they left, Everybody was glad to see them go. You see, Bonnie, and I'm sure you know already, but Bonnie, Charlie, Ivan, and Jeannie, they were not your normal guests. They were four separate hurricanes which blew through the state in one of the worst hurricane seasons on record. Now, Joel Ruth, a 52-year-old marine archaeologist, was also glad to see the storms go, but for a different reason than most people. He knew that there was a strong possibility that the storms might have uncovered something of value, so he began walking the beaches. Now, Joel had been studying a specific section of this beach in Brevard County for 20 years, but after these storms, he discovered on the beach, this dude discovered on the beach, 180 Spanish silver coins in near mint condition worth more than $40,000. The coins were from a Spanish treasure fleet of about a dozen ships that were destroyed by a hurricane in 1715. Then, 289 years later, another hurricane uncovered part of the treasure, which is what he found. You see, that's what storms do. A lot of people don't realize it. That's what storms do, especially the storms of life. They uncover treasure. They reveal valuable things. They teach us important lessons that we would not otherwise learn if we had not went through the storms. And that's what another treasure hunter by the name of David discovered as well. David was running from a maniac king, King Saul, who had nearly pinned him to the wall with a spear. David found himself in Gath, the territory of Palestinian terrorists, back then known as the Philistines. Their dictator, Abimelech, wanted David dead. And you remember the reason why he wanted David dead? Because David had killed one of his best warriors, a giant named Goliath. He had routed the dictator's entire army and had killed a lot of the dictator's men. And remember, King Saul was also very jealous. David was getting accolades of being the mighty warrior, and David also had a personal relationship with Saul's son, Jonathan. And this made him jealous as well. Now, David was scared and in trouble, so he pretended, when he was confronted by the king, he pretended to be insane when he was brought in front of the dictator. He made marks on the door and let saliva run down his beard. Well, King Saul thought, he said, this guy's insane. He can't hurt anybody. And he sent David away. And it was then that David uncovered some valuable treasures after the storm. After the storm, David discovered some valuable lessons worth much more than 180 Spanish silver coins, which he shares with us in Psalms 34. If you have your Bible with you this morning, turn with me to Psalm 34. Psalm 34, we're going to read the whole psalm, it's 1 through 22. And we're going to learn what trouble teaches us. And I want us to take a little time to break down each verse from this particular psalm this morning. 
It's Psalm 34, 1 through 22. God's word says this. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lion may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good, no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their names from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. We see from the scripture that David invites us to praise the Lord with him, to magnify and exalt, exalt his name even in times of trouble. We're in a time of trouble, aren't we? Even in times of trouble. I like the way the two-time Academy Award winning actor Denzel Washington put it. He says, a bad attitude is like a flat tire. Until you change it, you're not going anywhere. He's absolutely right. I know we're in a tough time right now. It's a stressful time. But we need to start praising the Lord, stop complaining, and start celebrating who he is. On January 12, 2010, a massive and devastating earthquake struck just outside Port-au-Prince, the capital city of Haiti. Haiti is the poorest country in the world. Countless buildings in the city collapsed, and over 100,000 lives were lost. The already shaky power grid was effectively destroyed, along with every other form of infrastructure. That night, with aftershocks rolling through the ground, almost all the residents in the city and the surrounding countryside stayed outside, torn with grief and fear. Even so, listen to this, even so, the night was filled with singing. An article on NPR summarized it this way. For the Western Hemisphere's poorest country, the earthquake that hit Haiti was an especially cruel blow. Despite this, it's hard to find a Haitian who doesn't profess a belief in a loving God. The Haitians proclaimed the loving kindness of God, and they sang. And they sang the entire night, right after the earthquake. You see, they had lost everything. But they still had a song in their heart about Jesus. They still praised him. They still knew he was a God of love. So praise the Lord in your trial. Why? Because God delivers you from all the fears. He rescues you from tight spots. And he snatches you up out of the jaws of fear. Psalm 34, 4. Let's start breaking this down. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Literally, he snatched me away from all my fears. Now, fear's out of hold of David, like a lion with its prey in its jaw. But God comes along and he snatches David away from the jaws of fear. Psalm 34, 5. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. Isaiah 65 says this. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. Isaiah uses the same word radiant to describe a mother's face lighting up at the sight of her children long after she gave them up for dead. And that's what God does for you when you look to him in times of trouble. He brings you out of hopeless situations and he makes your face shine. Psalm 34, 6 says, 
This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. Literally, he brought him to a wide place out of all his tight spots. God gets you out of tight spots and gives you freedom to pursue your dreams for him. There is no situation that you can get yourself into that God can't get you out of. A young Christian told the following story. He said, some years ago when I was learning to fly, my instructor told me to put the plane into a steep and extended dive. And the student said, I was totally unprepared for what was about to happen. After a brief time, the engine stalled and the plane began to plunge out of control. It soon became evident that the instructor was not going to help me out at all. And after a few seconds, what seemed like eternity, my mind began to function again, and I quickly corrected the situation. And immediately I turned to the instructor and began to vent my fearful frustration on him. And he very calmly said to me, there is no position you cannot get this plane into that I cannot get you out of. If you want to learn to fly, go up there and do it again. At that moment, God seemed to be saying to this young man, remember this as you serve me. There is no situation you can't get yourself into that I cannot get you out of. If you trust me, you'll be all right. And that lesson has been true many, many times over my life. Psalm 34, 7 said, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. The angel of the Lord, he is the same one, remember this, the angel of the Lord, he is the same one who rescued Hagar in the desert. He's the same one who rescued Isaac from his father's knife. He's the same one who rescued Israel from the Egyptians. You see, faith is often called, often the child of fear. Fear propelled Peter out of the boat. He'd ridden these waves before. He knew what these storms could do. Remember Peter, when he stepped out of the boat, how scared he was? And Jesus said, come out there, Peter. And Peter just was, was so scared. Peter had heard the stories. He'd seen the wreckage. He knew the wind widows. He knew the storms could kill. And Jesus still wanted him to step out of the boat. All night, he wanted Peter to step out of the boat. All night long, he tugged on sails. He wrestled with oars. And he searched every shadow on the horizon for hope. You know, when we look into Peter's eyes, and you won't see a man of conviction. You search his face and you won't find a grusty grimace. Now later on you will. You'll see his courage in the garden. You'll witness his devotion at Pentecost. You'll be held his faith to the epistles. But not on that night. If you look into his eyes on that night and all you see is fear. A suffocating, heart racing fear of a man who has no way out. If Peter had seen Jesus walking in the water during a calm, peaceful day. Do you think that would have, he would have walked out immediately if it was calm and there was no storm? Had the lake been carpet smooth and the journey pleasant, do you think Peter would have begged Jesus to take him on a stroll across the water? It's doubtful. But give a man a choice between sure death and crazy chance, and he'll take the chance every time. Because great acts of faith are seldom born out of calm calculation. Let me say something to you that I know will tie this all together. Remember this. It wasn't logic that caused Moses to raise his staff on the bank of the Red Sea. It wasn't medical research that convicted Naaman to dip seven times into the river. It wasn't common sense that caused Paul to abandon the law and embrace grace. And it wasn't a competent committee that prayed in a small room in Jerusalem for Peter to release from prison. It wasn't those things. It was fearful, desperate band of backed into corner believers. It was a church with no option. It was a congregation of have-nots pleading for help. And never were they stronger. You see, at the beginning of every act of faith, there is often a seed of fear. Biographies of bold disciples begin with chapters of honest terror. Fear of death, Fear of failure, fear of loneliness, fear of wasted life, fear of failing to know God. Faith begins when you see God on the mountain 
and you're in the valley, and you know that you're, you know that you're too weak to make that climb. You see what you need. You see what you have. And what you have isn't enough to accomplish what God wants. Peter had given his best, but his best wasn't enough. Moses had a sea in front of, front of him and an army behind him. The Israelites could swim or they could fight, but neither option was enough. Naaman had tried the cures and consulted the soothsayers. Traveling a long distance to plunge into a muddy river made little sense when there were clean ones in his backyard. But what option did he have? Paul had mastered the law. He had mastered the system. But one glimpse of God convinced him that sacrifice and symbols were not enough. The Jerusalem church knew that they had no hope of getting Peter out of prison. They had Christians who would fight, but they had too few. They had clout, but too little. They didn't need muscle. They needed a miracle. And so does Peter as he steps out of the boat onto that lake. Peter's aware of two facts. He's aware of two facts. He's going down and Jesus is staying up. He knows where he'd rather be. There's nothing wrong with this response. Faith that begins with fear will end up nearer the Father. A very well-known preacher talked about an experience that he had a while back. He said, I went to West Texas sometime back to speak at a funeral of a godly family friend. He'd raised five children. He said one of the sons was named Paul. And Paul told a story about his earliest memories of his father. And Paul said these words. He said it was spring in West Texas, which was tornado season. Paul was only three or four years old at the time, and he remembers vividly the day that a tornado hit their small town. His father hustled the kids indoors and had them lie on the floor while he laid a mattress over top of the children. But his father didn't climb under the protection. Paul remembers peeking out from under the mattress and seeing his father standing by an open window, watching the funnel cloud twist and churn across the prairie. When Paul saw his father, he knew where he wanted to be. Paul struggled out of his mother's arms, crawled out from under the mattress, and ran to wrap his arms around his dad's legs. Something told me, Paul said, that was the safest place to stand in a storm was next to my father. And something told Peter the same thing. Jesus was on the lake. Peter was in the boat. Lord, if it's you, Peter says, tell me to come to you on the water. Peter's not testing Jesus. He's pleading with Jesus. Stepping onto a stormy sea is not a move of logic. It's a move of desperation. Peter grabs the edge of the boat, throws out a leg, follows with another, and several steps are taken. It's as if an invisible ridge of rock runs beneath his feet, but there's no rocks. At the end of the ridge is the glowing face of a never say die friend in Jesus Christ. We do the same thing, don't we? We come to Christ in an hour of deep need. We abandon the boat of good works. We realize, like Moses, that human strength won't save us. So we look to God in desperation. We realize, like Paul, that all the good works in the world are puny when laid before the perfect one. We realize, like Peter, that standing the gap between us and Jesus is a feat too great for our feet. So we beg for help. And just like Peter, we hear his voice, and we step out of fear, hoping that our faith will be enough. Faith is not born at the negotiating table, where barters or gifts are in exchange for God's goodness. Faith is not an award given to the most learned. It's not a prize given to the most disciplined. It's not a title bequeathed to the most religious. Faith is a desperate dive out of the sinking boat of human effort and prayer, that God will be there to pull us out of the water. The Apostle Paul is clear. The supreme force of salvation is God's grace. Faith is saying, God, faith is saying this. Listen to me. Faith is saying, God, I'm stepping off this cliff. You either catch me or teach me to fly. That's faith. And we, like Paul, are aware of 
two things. We are great sinners, and we are in need of a great Savior. We, like Peter, are aware of two facts. We're going down, and God is standing up. So we scramble out. We leave behind the titanic of self-righteousness and stand on the solid path of God's grace, and surprisingly, we are able to walk on water. Death is disarmed, failures are forgivable, and life has a real purpose, and God is not only within sight, he is within reach. And all you have to do is extend a hand and step out of the boat. And with precious, wobbly steps, we draw closer to him. For a season of surprising strength, we stand for his promises. It doesn't make sense that we're able to do this. To stand on water makes no sense. And we don't claim to be worthy of such an incredible gift. When people ask how in the world we can keep our balance during such stormy times as in today, we don't boast. We don't brag. We point unabashedly to the one who makes it possible. Our eyes are on him. When you come in here on Sunday morning, this worship team is like life is normal. They're happy, they're singing, they're praising. Because we have a Savior that we trust and we know. And you can't convince me on Sunday morning when I'm in here with these people that there's anything wrong. They're just, they all smile. They laugh. They know the rough world. But they know their Savior. In April of 2019, in Oregon, the Washington County Sheriff's Office responded to a 911 call from a woman who reported hearing a burglar locked in her bathroom. She saw shadows shifting under the door, and after officers appeared on the scene, they heard a persistent rustling under the same door. And the officers issued several commands to come out and brought in a canine unit for backup. After getting no response, they opened the door with guns drawn to account the suspect. The suspect was an Ottoman robot vacuum cleaner. Sheriff Deputy Brian Rogers said we entered the bathroom and saw a very thorough vacuum job being done by a Roomba vacuum cleaner. The BuzzFeed article said the scene was, quick, the scene was clear and probably quite clean too. I tell that story because many times our fears are unfounded. We think something's happened and it's really not. God's in control of all of it. Many times our fears are unfounded, but even when they're legitimate, God delivers us from them. And it's the first lesson trouble teaches us. And that first lesson is, praise the Lord, because he delivers you from fear. Boast in God, because he saves you out of all your worries. Exalt his name, because he gets you out of all your tight spots. And the second trouble teaches you to do is, fear the Lord, because he provides for you in times of hardship. We are in a time of hardship. Respect the Lord because he meets your every need. Trust and obey God because he supplies your every lack. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Men, let me say something to you, men. It's not the sissies who go to the Lord for help. It's the mighty men. It's the warriors. It's the providers. It's the men that love their children and love their wives and love their families that go to the Lord in prayer. The heroes in this verse, they don't trust in their own strength. They don't rely on their own resources. Instead, they find refuge in the Lord and they are made stronger for it. David, the author of this psalm, was the greatest war hero Israel ever had. The greatest war hero ever. And he often went to the Lord in prayer. That's what mighty men do. Not sissies. Mighty men. You have a family. Go to the Lord in prayer. Men, start taking back your homes. Start taking back your country, men. And do it because you love Jesus and love your family. Psalm 34, 9 and 10 says, 
Fear the Lord, you his holy people. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. You see, the self-sufficient go hungry. Those who seek the Lord are filled. That's what David, the writer of the psalm, discovered throughout his life. When he was running from Saul in the territory of the Palestinian terrorists, he needed protection and supplies. He needed a strong defense and food for his men. And that is exactly what God gave him. God provided every need he had. He was on the run. He was scared. And he looked to God and God took care of him. Not what we want. What we need. God supplied all his needs in this situation. God did not supply his greeds. No, God supplied his needs when he was in trouble. And God will do the same for you. In his book called An Unstoppable Force, Earl McManus talks about the day when he was ministering in South Dallas. He was shepherding a small congregation, but they began to grow. So the leaders of the church began to look for a place to build a larger church building. And that's when they spotted an acre of land for sale near downtown Dallas. Given its location, they thought it strange that the property was available, but they were excited at their good fortune. The small group of poor people, many who were on government assistance, began to pray and worked hard to raise the money for the property. And eventually they were able to purchase it after receiving financial help from the Association of Churches. Then, as the congregation applied for building permits, they discovered that the city of Dallas had declared the property unbuildable. The acre of land in prime location was nothing more than a worthless landfill. McManus grieved over the waste of precious time and money. He said, we had bought an acre of garbage. Core samples down at least 25 feet turned up nothing but trash. All McManus could do was ask his little congregation and to pray and believe that God would use even the worst of human mistakes to perform the greatest of miracles. Fast forward. After months of prayer, McManus asked for more core samples to be taken of the ground. Months later. This time, the researchers found soil instead of garbage. The city gave them clearance to build, and the same realtor who sold them property offered them three times the amount for which he had sold to them. McManus says this. He says, I cannot tell you what happened beneath the ground at 2815 South Avenue Street. All I can tell you is what I know, and that what I know is that God took control and took my failure and performed a miracle. In their time of need, God provided. And God will do for you as well. God supplies your every need, but only when you fear him. Only if you take refuge in, in him. As verse 8 puts it, or seek the Lord, like verse 10 says. Verse 9 says, makes it very clear, for those who fear him lack nothing. So what does it mean to fear God? What does it mean to fear God? David tells us what it means to fear God. Look at Psalm 34, 11 through 14. He says, Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongues from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. You see, fearing God is saying what God wants you to say and doing what God wants you to do as you seek and pursue peace in all your relationships. In other words, when your relationship with each other is right, your relationship with God is right. Remember what John said in 1 John 4, 21? He says, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sisters. Remember that? We'll talk about love and talk about and talk about keeping the peace. L listen to this. This story will blow your mind. I read this this week, and I had to, had to talk about it. In the fall of 2018, Lucy Rogers. Lucy Rogers, now I don't talk politics from the pulpit. You guys know that, but i got to tell this story. Lucy Rogers is a Democrat. Zach Mayo is a Republican. And they were both aggressively competing for the same state house in Lama Ola County, Vermont. Okay? Both ended up visiting every single home in the district. 
all 2,000 plus, each wanting to win in the worst way. However, their highly competitive race took a dramatic turn at their debate in October of 2018. Listen to this. The candidates had got together, and they asked the moderator for a few extra minutes at the end of the, at the, end of the debate to do something together. They stood up from their tables and began moving furniture, preparing to play a duet together. Lucy grabbed her cello while Zach picked up his guitar, and they played the song Society. It's a song written by Eddie Vedder about longing for a less competitive society. Their rendition so resonated with the folks in northern Vermont, a CBS News reporter actually saw houses that had signs for both candidates, a clear indication that the winner of this race had already been decided. It was a landslide victory for civility. Please, folks, we talk about getting along. In our contentious political climate, Let's love and respect one another even when you disagree in each other's beliefs. Because to love each other, just as his word says, to love each other is to love God himself. Let's stop fighting over the garbage. Let's stop worrying about Republican Democrat. Let's be children of God. And my friends, that's what fearing God is all about. To fear God means to do the hard work of pursuing peace. The hard work of entering into a state of wholeness and unity. The hard work of seeking a restored relationship. Are you at odds this morning with someone? And then pursue peace with that person. Experience God's abundance of life. And these are the lessons that trouble teaches you. The first is praise God because he delivers you from fear. Second is fear God because he provides for you. And third, trouble teaches you this. Cry out to God. Because he responds to you in fear or in trouble. Cry out to God because he responds to you in trouble. Listen to these words from the psalmist again. Psalm 34, 15, and 20. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their names from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous persons may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Keep that in mind, that last part there. Not one of them will be broken. I'll, I'll swing back around to that. In other words, God protects his own from extreme distress. Listen to me. Jesus found this to be true. Even though he suffered horrible pain on the cross, remember this? John 19 tells us that they did not break his legs. John 19 says they did not break his legs. That was in fulfillment of this verse from the Psalms that says they would protect his bones and not one of them would be broken. That was in fulfillment of this verse. And it's also in John 19. God allowed the Roman soldiers to go only so far with Christ's body and no farther. God puts limits on the amount of Christ's suffering, and he puts limits on your suffering as well. Psalm 34, 21 and 22 says, Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. No one who puts their trust in the Lord will ever be punished for their sin. That's because Jesus was punished instead of us on the cross. Listen to this. Talk about civility. Antonio Bundy is a police dispatcher in Lafayette, Indiana. And she was praised for her kindness towards a caller in the January of 2019. A young boy had dialed 911. And Bundy asked him what his emergency was. The young man said he had a bad day at school and he needed help. Normally, in a situation like this, a 911 operator would scold the caller for wasting police resources, but Bundy took a different stand. She asked the boy what was troubling him, and he told her it was a math assignment. The boy read through the problem, and he said, what is three times four plus one times four? And Bundy walked him through the steps to solve it. 
And she said the brief interaction was a nice break to her otherwise busy day. And the boy said that was the only problem he needed help with. He thanked the dispatcher for her assistance. And he said, he said, I'm sorry for calling you, he told her, but I just needed some help and someone to talk to. The dispatcher said, you're fine. We're always here to help. Christians, are you always here to help? Christians, are you always extending a hand? Christians, are you always telling people of the promise you have in Christ Jesus? And in the same way, God is there to help, no matter how big or small the problem. These are the lessons we learned today. Praise God because he delivers you from the trouble. Fear God because he provides for you in trouble. And cry out to God because he responds to you in trouble. And I want to close my message this morning with this. I dedicate this closing to all the parents who have lost a child. To get through that with the help of Christ has got to be one of the most difficult things that I could ever imagine. And I dedicate this closing to all you parents who have lost children. Let me ask you this. What if God's response in our time of trouble is not the response we desire? I found this closing on a sermon website that I wanted to share. The author of the story talked about a time in July of 2019. He said, I experienced a type of suffering that I wouldn't wish upon my worst enemy. He said, the death of my oldest son, our little oldest son, Michael, who was nine months of age at the time, was in perfect health. He loved to play with his parents, to laugh at the dog and to wave his little hand at passerby. He would be content to ride in the stroller as my wife, Heather, and I pushed him around our neighborhood or around the lakes of South Minneapolis, Minnesota. On Thursday afternoon, July 23rd, 2009, Micah had fallen out of his high chair, reaching for his coat. While he sustained a black eye from his fall, no one felt the condition was very serious, much less life-threatening. On each of the next two days, various pediatric doctors saw Micah because he developed a low fever and an unusual cough. The doctors diagnosed Micah with pneumonia. Now, this was probably as a result of inhaling something down his lungs when he fell, which was later found out to be a simple, small pea. A pea went into his lungs. The doctors weren't very concerned. They felt that whatever was causing pneumonia in his lungs would probably dissolve in a matter of days, and he would be back to his normal and energy self in short order. And we were happy. On Sunday morning, July 25th, 6, I drove to the local Target to fill a prescription. When I arrived home, my wife came running out of the house screaming at me. Micah had stopped breathing. Micah had stopped breathing. Within two minutes, the EMTs arrived. A few minutes later, the ambulance arrived. But no one could revive Micah. And the gravity of the situation hit my wife and I. And we lay on the kitchen floor. I held my wife in my arms as we screamed and cried together, praying as earnestly as we could that God would allow our little son to take a breath and come back to us. But God didn't answer our prayers. We never heard him cry again. Michael was eventually taken to the Children's Hospital in Minneapolis where the doctors were finally able to revive Michael's breathing. But after nearly one hour without oxygen, there was no hope for Michael's brain activity. Over the next 24 hours, we prayed that our sovereign and good God would miraculously heal our little boy, but by 10 a.m. the next morning, we were told that Michael had so little brain activity remaining that there was no hope for recovery. We were told that we needed to say goodbye to our pride and joy, our little boy. And after a very emotional family gathering around Micah's bedside, each of us had our own opportunity to say our goodbye. Heather decided that she could not be in the room when Micah's ventilator was removed. She said her final goodbye by encouraging Micah to run to Jesus. 
A few minutes later, I held my son in my arms as the doctor gave me the ventilator and other equipment that was keeping our son breathing. In the single greatest moment of anguish that I've ever or will ever experience, my son's heart stopped beating. And Heather and I have grappled with this very real question of how a good and sovereign God, if he exists, could allow this to happen. If God could create the stars, planets, and the human body, master the precision of gravitational forces, how could he allow a pee to go down into the lungs of our son and kill our son? How could this happen to our son when no pediatrician has ever heard of this ever happening before? But the author continues. He says, but rather than pushing me away from God, Micah's death has paradoxically actually drawn me closer to God. Looking back at my life since Micah's death, I believe that Micah's life and death has impacted me in many ways that are consistent with what the Bible says. Generally about how and why God uses significant personal suffering to achieve his purposes. The Bible does not apologize for the clear fact that God sometimes chooses to use the worst human suffering imaginable to achieve his purposes. And based upon the description of Jesus in the Bible, Jesus, we know, we know Jesus deserved human acclaim. He healed the sick, he taught about love, and he challenged hypocritical religious leaders. He deserved to be significant in the eyes of the world and to become a significant person in the eyes of the world like a president or a king, or an emperor, but instead, our Jesus, instead of becoming the king of Israel, he died an agonizing death on a cross. And through the cross, Christians believe that he accomplished something more than he ever could have accomplished if he was a great political ruler. Through his perfect life and agonizing death, we believe that Jesus redeemed my life and the life of all his followers for all time. And the author says this. He says, I often return to the story of Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac, his son, as a source of encouragement in my own faith. The story is indeed difficult to understand in many ways. It doesn't make logical sense, just like the death of our son Micah. But to me, that's the point. Like us, Abraham had the capacity for logic. He could have questioned or defied God's demand because it didn't make sense. But Abraham, without questioning God or his ways, was ready to be obedient to God, even to the point of death of his own son at his own hand. The author says, For Heather and me, we have learned that we must walk as Abraham walked with God and walk in faith. We will not know the purpose God achieved through Micah and his death, at least not until we see God in Micah again. Even through anger at God, unfulfilled dreams, and nights of weeping, we believe that God's plan for us and Micah involved peas wider than windpipes, little graves, and short time on this earth. We believe that God has power over death and can bring significance even through Micah's death. Through these difficult circumstances, our faith, the assurance of things hoped for, has become clearer to us than it ever has before. And he says, someday I will hold my little Micah again in heaven. Our happiness in being together will have not been reduced by the pain that stuck in Micah's throat. Instead, we will be able to spend eternity together learning about the endless wisdom and power of God. Until then, I can be thankful and live in faith. That God uses events in our lives to teach us more about Him, including how He wants us to find strength, joy, and significance in Him. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Sometimes we have to walk in this life with tears in our eyes and no light, but holding on to the hand of Christ. And He'll take us to the end if you just reach out your hand. You can have that today. If you'd like to know more about this, Jesus, please send us an email. Give us a call at the church. Call my personal phone. And I'll tell you more about this, Jesus, and how you can make him more to your life. But all you have to do is come. Come today just as you are.
and consider that price Jesus paid for their remission. Our broken hearts will lead us to repent and seek God's grace. When our hearts are broken, God can bring new power to our lives. When we experience forgiveness, there is a new joy in our lives. And when our broken hearts are given to God, He can make our lives beautiful again. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we are broken. We need you. We need to talk to you, to hear you, to, to take comfort in you, dear Lord. We just ask that you commune with us as we try to commune with you. And we ask that you allow us to hear it, to feel it, to know it. And we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Love God, love people, share Jesus.